it's nice to see somebody in, in my old shirt, you know. I understood then what Time Time was all about. It needed somebody to stick the ball in the net. We got the best fans in the country. This is the only job I've ever wanted. I've always said I wanted to play for Newcastle at some stage, it's a dream come true. I tell you, there's no better place to play a game of football than at St James's Park. Football in Newcastle in the 21st century. A huge multi-million pound business starring international players in an impressive stadium that graces Europe. Yet back on Victorian Tyneside, the black and white origins belong to two clubs and communities in the city. Newcastle was certainly not united. Well, it was pretty well divided. Um, obviously, East End represented the, the east side of the city. They the originated in Biker. And, and covered uh, the, the Biker and Heaton area and eventually moved to, to Heaton as a base. And West End uh, represented probably more the city centre and Westgate Hill and uh, the west of the city as it was then. And they had their base at St James's Park. In 1881, this side became known as Stanley Football Club in Biker. But there was often confusion with Stanley in County Durham. So before switching to a ground next to a huge railway junction, not far from Chillingham Road in Heaton, the club changed its name to Newcastle East End. The West End team was housed on the town moor, overlooking Granger's elegant Leeses Terrace, close to the city centre, and there was a fierce rivalry in those formative years. Both clubs found it hard to make ends meet. Attendances were small, and it was only the deep pockets of the club's directors that enabled Newcastle United to take root. In 1893, when, uh, when West End folded, um, the West End supporters weren't happy at all, and there was a lot of animosity towards East End because East End came over and virtually took over the club and, and uh, took hold of St James's Park and started from scratch there. And it took probably, uh, from what the, the records show, about 12 months before the West Enders started to uh, uh, support the old East End club, uh, and it was really a change of name that that really uh, made things flourish. And so Newcastle became united. League football arrived in the shape of second division action a year later, and the club replaced the old East End colours of red and white with the famous black and white stripes. The Magpies were born. Promotion was achieved in 1898 with the first of a vast array of talent on the field, players like centre forward Jock Petty. Jock Petty, yes, he, he was probably Newcastle's first centre-forward hero. Uh, he was a big Scotsman uh, that came uh, from Glasgow and uh, he scored an awful lot of goals as, as, as centre-forward up to uh, 1900. And then he was followed by a whole line of centre-forwards thereafter. By the time United embarked on what was to be their first championship winning season in 1904-05, the Magpies camp was full of special footballers. A lot of them were Geordies, you know, people like Colin Veach and Jackie Rutherford were, were, were local lads, but, but they also brought in a whole pile of Scotsmen, and uh, they were good footballers, uh, people like uh, Andy Aitken, Peter McWilliam, Jimmy Howie, uh, a particular Irishman called Bill McCracken as well, and uh, uh, they had a couple of good goal scorers with Bill, Bill Appleyard and then Albert Shepherd, and uh, they all gelled together and they had a side who uh, pushed the ball around in a, in a celebrated style, you know, neat possession type football. 
That brand of football brought three First Division championships in five years. After 1905, the Black and Whites won the title in 1907 and 1909. The great rivals at the turn of the century were, were Aston Villa and uh, Sunderland. And uh, uh, Newcastle overtook both those clubs. And, and during the Edwardian era, um, you know, the, the main rival was really Everton. Uh, so Newcastle and Everton uh, were, 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 were chief rivals right up to the more or less the First World War. This is the Newcastle team coming down the steps in the new main stand at St James's in 1910. Crowds had got up to around about 30,000 and then in 1905 they completely redeveloped St James's Park and the capacity was up to 60 or 70,000. There was regular gates of 50,000 and over during that era and afterwards. Just for the record, Albert Shepherd hit a hat-trick in a 6-1 win over Bradford City. Now here's another piece of film history. The first known moving pictures at the newly opened Old Trafford in 1910. Newcastle United were the main attraction. They did dominate for seven to ten years, and that, that's only been really repeated on a handful of occasions. You know, Aston Villa and Sunderland did it before the turn of the century. Newcastle did it in the 1900s. There was Huddersfield in the 20s, Arsenal in the 30s, and then more recently, obviously, Manchester United. But we were the team of the land, and everybody knew every player in the, in the side and we challenged for the championship every season and just about reached the cup final every year as well. That's true, but the Magpies lost three finals, all at the old National Stadium at Crystal Palace in 1905, 6 and 8. On each occasion, United's celebrated football deserted them. Talk about a London hoodoo. Here in 1910, they drew nil-nil against Barnsley, went on to win the replay at Goodison Park. On that glory day, Albert Shepherd scored twice, including the first penalty in a final. Twelve months on, skipper Colin Veach led the Black and Whites into their fifth final against Bradford City. This too went to a replay at Old Trafford, but despite dominating the match, Newcastle lost their fourth final 1-0. United's Edwardian Masters reign came to an end as war arrived in 1914, but they owed much of their success to two players, first Colin Veach. He was a local lad and uh, he, was a, he was a great scholar and tactician as well and he was one of the, uh, the, the players that um, certainly put the side together because we didn't have managers in those days. Um, it was really left largely to the players to develop a, a, a side and, and Veach was at the forefront of that. The winger Jackie Rutherford, who was a, a local lad, uh, played a lot of games, uh, scored a lot of goals for a winger with nearly 100 goals and he, he, went, he played five cup finals and won three championship medals and played 13 times for England, I think. So that's got to be, uh, he's got to be up there with the very best. After the First World War, the top price for a season ticket at St James's was three pounds and five shillings, 25 bob for standing. By the 20s, United were giving good value. Like skipper Frank Hudspeth, an outstanding survivor of the Edwardian entertainers, and his fullback partner Bill McCracken. Both still hold the club's record for being longest serving players with 19 years each. They've been joined by Stan Seymour, a County Durham lad who played on the wing and knew how to score goals. Hudspeth skippered United in the 1924 FA Cup semi final at St Andrews against Manchester City. Centre forward Neil Harris scored twice to take United to the new Wembley Stadium. It was only the second ever at Wembley and Wembley was the new national stadium and it was a special cup final. We played old rivals Aston Villa who were a very uh, big side at the time and uh, you know, it was the first trek for all the, the Geordies down to Wembley and uh, we won 2-0 with um, Neil Harris, a, a, a Scottish centre forward, scoring the goals and Stan Seymour getting one as well. So it was a, it was a great cup win and the first of uh, many treks to Wembley. Back home and under construction, the city's new landmark that would become famous the world over. The Tyne Bridge was taking shape. United's team was in even better shape. They'd signed five feet five inch Scottish centre forward Huey Gallagher from Airdrie for a club record six and a half thousand pounds in 1925. He became an instant sensation. 
he was a typical old style Scottish footballer. wasn't very big, but had great skills. A tanner ball player, they used to call him in the north. And he came to Newcastle and he just displayed that type of skill on the ball. He would go past two or three players and then you know, hit the net uh, on a regular basis. And he was a personality. He always argued with referees, he, he always argued with other players, but at, at the end of the day he could put the ball in the net and the crowd just loved him and, and he's certainly one of the greatest heroes in the club's history and one of the best ever centre forwards in, in football in this country. In season 1926-27, Gallagher skippered the Magpies to the First Division Championship. The team was on parade at Gallagher. They had a solid defence marshalled by Frank Hudspeth and up front the forward line was a was a midget forward line all of them were virtually either five foot five five foot six or five foot seven uh, but the five of them were, were absolute dynamite and uh, uh, they scored lots and lots of goals and, and Gallagher led the line with 39 in the season. When Gallagher went it was very controversial certainly Gallagher went to Chelsea for, for nearly a record fee um, and uh, you know, he didn't want to go, he, he loved Tyneside, he was, uh, everybody loved him on Tyneside and he wanted to stay, but for some reason the club wanted him to go and he didn't get on with, with Newcastle's first ever manager, who was another Scotsman, Andy Cunningham, and uh, the club decided to cash in at, in, at the time in 1930. However, the Gallagher hero worship was far from finished. A record crowd at St James's of 68,386 saw Newcastle win 1-0 when we, Huey, returned with the Londoners in September 1930. He played on for a number of years with Chelsea and Derby and one or two other clubs and eventually came back to settle on Tyneside because he loved the area so much. And uh, unfortunately, he, he died in 1957. He committed suicide, uh, jumped in front of the, the York to Edinburgh Express train at, at, in, just outside Gateshead. Back in the dark winter days of the early 30s, it was never easy keeping the St James's pitch in good condition. Cold braziers were used to thaw out the snow and ice. No undersoil heating in those days. Manager Cunningham had fashioned a new Magpie 11 and he guided United back to Wembley in 1932. King George V was introduced to both sides before one of the most controversial FA Cup finals in history got underway. And Newcastle were a goal down to Herbert Chapman's Arsenal in 12 minutes. Arsenal were one up, then Newcastle's Jimmy Richardson chased the ball right up to the Arsenal line, but did the ball cross it? Movie Tone's exclusive film, which was of course later reproduced in the press, gave a clear and definite answer to the question. Play continued, and centre forward Jimmy Allen equalised for Newcastle and later scored again to win the match. So 2-1 to United, the first team to come from behind to win a Wembley final. Jimmy Nelson lifted the cup, behind him two-goal hero Jack Allen. Incredibly, around a quarter of a million people welcomed the team home. Bandsmen had to scatter, but the chief constable's horse reared and fell. What a homecoming. No member of this victorious team will ever forget the thrill of this riotous reception. The North is justly proud of their team, and how they show it. On behalf of the citizens of Newcastle-upon-Tyne, it gives me great pleasure as Lord Mayor to congratulate our team Just a few days later, the FA Cup was on display before an end-of-season league match at St James's. The Prince of Wales, later to become King Edward VIII, was introduced to the United side. But it was the end of another era. They just fell apart, to be honest, uh, as sometimes teams do. You know, they had lots of good players. Sammy Weaver was the pick of the side at that particular time, a very strong workhouse of a midfield player who was an England player. But the, the whole side uh, fell apart in, in 1933 and in that, that particular season that they even, they even defeated Liverpool 9-2 that season and Everton 7-3 I think it was in the space of a week but still were relegated. The big time returned briefly at St James's in 1935 when United had an FA Cup rematch against Arsenal. The huge crowd spilled over onto the pitch at one stage but the years leading up to the outbreak of World War II were largely dismal until Stan Seymour returned. Seymour was certainly a dominant figure. He, he, he was a great player. He played right through the 20s, part of the FA Cup side and the Championship side in the 20s. Um, then left the club, retired. Uh, 
and then returned in the late 30s as a director, and it, it's a very rare occurrence that we'll have an ex-player as a director anyway. Uh, but Seymour joined the club, and he, and he was Newcastle United through and through, and he, and he worked right through the war years to rebuild the club, and uh, he did that, bringing in a lot of good young local players and uh, some ex exquisite buys and, and developed the side that eventually got back into the top division. Just after the war, Charles and Kathleen Scully were married in their home city of Birmingham. More than 50 years on, they're still catching the train north to Newcastle, still staying overnight at the old county hotel opposite the station, and still season ticket holders watching their favourite football team. In fact, Charles was hooked when he first saw United at West Brom in 1932. The first thing I admired about Newcastle was how smart they looked. But anyway, in the second half, Newcastle came out and they run the Albion off the legs for, for skill and, and they scored two goals, Newcastle did. And I thought to myself, if this is the team that uh, knows how to play football, I know. but the thing I didn't know at that my age then was how far away it was from Birmingham. I thought, oh dear. <laughs> Backed by enormous support from the fans and boosted by Stan Seymour's wise signings, United's post-war progress was dramatic. Football boomed and Newcastle latched onto that boom and nowhere uh, were there more crowds than at St James's Park, uh, virtually an average gate of 56,000 at every single game. And you know, I think the players rose to that support and uh, you know, Seymour's side developed and gelled together with lots of uh, young names that would become big stars in the 50s. Seymour's recruitment of a rugged wing half called Joe Harvey from Bradford City in October 1945 proved highly significant. Legendary centre half Frank Brennan also arrived, while wartime gold machine Albert Stubbins was allowed to go to Liverpool. But Jackie Milburn had come out of the pit at Ashington and began to carve his own Northumbria name with pride. All the top players who which ended up being top players, were all a bunch of lads together, you know. And that, that was the, the really core of the 51 team, because there wasn't a bad lad in the team, you know, and we all played for each other. In October 1946, Len Shackleton signed from Bradford for a club record £13,000. And on his debut, United rattled up their record 13-0 home victory over Newport County. Shack scored six. Shackleton was brilliant, a showman. He would go on to earn the nickname Clown Prince of Soccer at Sunderland, but not before helping Newcastle reach the FA Cup semi-final in 1947. New manager George Martin switched Milburn from the right wing to centre forward, and backed by national record crowds averaging more than 56,000, led Newcastle to promotion in 1948. The 50s in Newcastle. Traffic filled the city centre, and if players like George Robledo, Bobby Mitchell and Bobby Cowell hit the town, well, it was probably just to do some shopping. With an increasingly powerful squad, United finished fourth, fifth and fourth again in their first three seasons in Division One. But it was in the FA Cup, with Stan Seymour back in charge, that the club made a huge national impact. In 1951, Milburn had scored in every round, before United came up against Wolves in a semi-final replay at Huddersfield. John Walker gave Wolves a 17th minute lead. Newcastle, however, were not prepared to let them get away with it like that. The next 15 minutes saw them going all out to equalise. And this they succeeded in doing when Milburn banged one home. The Newcastle supporters cheering over this happy event had scarcely died down when they were given cause to cheer again by Mitchell. Another 2-1 victory. So Newcastle meet Blackpool on the great day. So 19 years after their last triumphant visit, United fans were back at Wembley. Joe Harvey skippered the side, which included War Jackie, while Milburn's England colleague, the veteran winger Stanley Matthews, was still looking for his first cup winner's medal with Blackpool. Lido gets possession. Blackpool hesitated, expecting an offside decision, and Jackie Milburn's away on his own, a beautiful solo effort.
Taylor surrounded. Back heels to Milburn, who beat Farm from about 25 yards. His second one, the second half, uh, was magic. He somehow wrapped his foot round it and uh, he, he got it and, he, and it flew in the net. And I think that's the, uh, the Wembley goal of all time, Chucky's. But really, the, the way he was shaping up, it should have went out the stadium. Now that was that. Newcastle 2, Blackpool no. And now for the presentation of the cup. Harvey, making sure his hands were clean, receives it from His Majesty. What an ovation Harvey got. But still, there was time for a word at the movie turn mic. Hello, Tyneside. Here we are, we're bringing the cup back for you now. So, wait for us on Thursday. Sure enough, Tyneside welcomed the side back to St James's, and they all wanted to hear War Jackie. This is the proudest day of all lives, isn't it, lads? <laughs> We knew what would happen at Wembley. We all had a bag full of confidence last Saturday morning. And anyhow, we don't want to come back with it. And he says, uh, ah, he says, well, had you going there? Eh? You thought we couldn't do it. Eh? He says, I was sure you. And there was tears coming down his head. The 1952 FA Cup run provided the perfect stage for George Robledo, the older of two Chilean brothers in the side. His gentleman, George. He spoke better English than a whole lot of us, <laughs> that's for sure. And uh, George would compliment Jack with his strength and his heading ability. Newcastle's defence of the FA Cup almost got off to a disastrous start. They were 2 0 down to Aston Villa in the third round at St James's Park with not long to go. Bobby Mitchell's second put United in front before Rob Lido rifled in the fourth, the great escape. By now, 21-year-old Ronnie Simpson had taken over in goal from the injured Jack Fairbrother. He arrived from Scottish side third Lanark. I don't think I realised what I was coming to. It was magnificent. People were fabulous. I didn't want to go home. I knew I was at home, really, within two weeks. You've heard these expressions before, but I really meant it. I was at home here. There were 69,000 excited people at White Hart Lane for the fourth round cup tie clash, cheerleaders and all. <laughs> Already, Newcastle looked like winners, and within a quarter of an hour, they were one up, thanks to George Robledo. But Newcastle were much better able to deal with the quagmire than Spurs, and presently they got their second when Mitchell banged one in. Don't say it, don't say it. After about 20 minutes play in the second period, the cup holders made pretty sure of getting through this round when Robledo scored again. It looked like the end for Spurs, but they did put in a number of very vigorous attacks. If it hadn't been for Simpson in goal, Newcastle might have had their lead reduced, but he was very much on the spot. Newcastle won the day by three goals to nil. After beating Swansea at Vetchfield with a goal from Bobby Mitchell in round five, the Black and Whites travelled to Portsmouth, who'd been league champions in 49 and 50. It turned out to be a fantastic day at Fratton Park for Jackie Milburn. Not many players can do it themselves, and Jackie could do it himself. If you were down, you could trust Jackie would come up with something that was outstanding. Great shooting power he had. It was very, very quick, very fast. There's a saying he goes here that he, he could catch pigeons, you know, he'd go out in the morning and the pigeons would be out in the ground and Jackie would be after them just about catch them, you know. Milburn certainly gave Portsmouth the bird. His hat-trick, along with George Robledo's goal close to time, sealed an impressive 4-2 victory. Blackburn stood between United and a second successive final, but only the brilliance of Simpson kept Rovers at bay in a goalless semi-final. In the Elland Road replay, Robledo climbed to not home Milburn's perfect cross and put the Magpies 1-0 ahead. Blackburn equalised. Then, four minutes from time, another Robledo header, this time handled on the line. I think it was a penalty kick with Bob Mitchell. There were, there were, uh, nobody was wanting to take it or something. Mitch just come across and plunked it down and bunk, and then it went. So United were back at Wembley. Skipper Harvey introduced his players to guest of honour the Prime Minister Winston Churchill. Arsenal were also skippered by a Joe, Joe Mercer. But this final between two great clubs was in truth something of a letdown. Doug Lishman struck the Newcastle bar as manager Seymour looked on anxiously. 
But in the 82nd minute, Bobby Mitchell crossed to the far post and George Robledo headed his sixth FA Cup goal of the season. It was enough. The Gunners had no ammunition left and the Cup was on its way back to Tyneside in the safe hands of Joe Harvey. Joe Harvey was a wonderful skipper, probably the best skipper. I've played with a lot of skippers, but he was by far the best skipper I've played with. He was a great leader. He wasn't the best footballer in the side, but he could bring the best out in the others, which I think captain's ideal with that. I played against Joe Harvey in my teenage years, came to Newcastle and scored here as a probably a teenager against Joe Harvey. I didn't like the way he looked at me when I scored the goal, so I kind of went and played on the other side. As the London train draws in, it's a big moment for Newcastle. Joe Harvey is back with a cup, and nobody can hear what the Lord Mayor is saying, but as a club director, he's just as excited as the whole town. In winning the cup two years running, the United have done something that hasn't been done since Blackburn did it 60 years ago. And so to their own ground at St James's Park, with 50,000 cheering as Joe and his team make their way round the ground. I don't know what I'm going to say now I've got home with it. <laughs> Somebody asked me if they'd given it to us. And I told them we'd beaten the best teams in the country. <laughs> and we really earned it this time. Two weeks later, the FA Cup was sealed in a box and taken on tour. Harvey and his team left for a 70-day, 16-match trip to South Africa. In 1955, with several different players and now managed by Dougie Livingstone, United did it again. But this time it took nine games to reach Wembley, including a semi-final replay against third division York City. About 60,000 turned up for the semi-final replay, and Skular having won the toss for Newcastle, York City kicked off, resolved to win this time. Only three minutes had elapsed, however, when Newcastle, in striped shirts, opened the scoring through white. In the second half, Newcastle put on very strong pressure. The ground here at Roker Park, Sunderland, was in good condition, and the match was fought out at a very fast pace. Newcastle were definitely in winning mood today. Right at the end, they clinched their victory when Keeble scored. Now for Wembley. But for Charlie Crow, now club captain, there'd be no playing return to Wembley. His ankle injury hadn't responded to treatment. Norman Smith and I both agreed that it was no good. So we're walking off the field and around the perimeter. There's Mitch and Chucky. And uh, he says, all right, Charlie? I says, uh, no, no. I says, uh, uh, it's not good enough, uh, Jack. I says, I'll not be playing. Right he says, you'll be all right, man. He says, we'll carry you. I says, bloody Milburn. No. I said, Jackie, it's the final man. <laughs> United fans swarmed along Wembley Way for an unprecedented third time in five years. Many of the players would have felt at home in the dressing room, but only one of them was about to make history. John Edward Thompson Milburn was to score the fastest ever goal in a Wembley final. Yet manager Livingston nearly dropped him. It seemed crazy, really. There was rumours that uh, he wasn't going to play Jackie, but uh, I think from higher above came the, the word that Jackie would be playing, you know. Newcastle, in fact, put in a very rapid counter-thrust, and City were forced to concede a corner. Len White took the kick, a beauty, and Jack Milburn headed through. Yes, Newcastle were one up with a goal in less than a minute. Towards the end of the first half, Manchester seemed almost inspired and reached their real form with a series of attacking movements. It was from one of these raids that a high centre from Hayes was headed in by Bobby Johnston for the equaliser. So it was one all at half time. In less than ten minutes, Bobby Mitchell took a very nice pass and beat Trotman from a sharp angle. So United were in the lead again, and all the time they looked like going further ahead. Mitchell played a big part in Newcastle's third goal. Driving down the wing and making a perfect opening, George Hanna did the rest. <laughs> the moment of triumph came when Her Majesty presented the cup to Jimmy Schooler. Newcastle's captain had played a great and tireless game, leading his men to a well-deserved victory. United have now won the cup six times, equaling the record. 
the end of the story is told in these exclusive pictures in the dressing room. For a cup like that, at a moment like this, nothing but the best. Champagne. Winning the FA Cup three times in five years is, is a, at the time was a really, really big achievement in so much that uh, the FA Cup was the competition to win. Uh, while the championship was important, everybody wanted to win the FA Cup because it had the glamour, it had the, uh, the final at Wembley and everybody everywhere knew Newcastle United and the players that played in those three sides. They were a team, they represented this city proudly I think, you know. Sadly, the United glory days slipped away after that, so too Harvey, Cowell and the seemingly irreplaceable Jackie Milburn.